The Craddock 4 amnesty hearing continues in Port Elizabeth next week. If Harold Snayman does testify, he may disclose dramatic new details of the chain of command. We'll have to see what the doctors say. It is difficult for all of us to listen to former policemen and other perpetrators confess to the terrible truth about murder and torture. One cannot even imagine the pain the family members and survivors must go through. But what does this process of remembering the past do to the perpetrators and their families? And what makes someone do such terrible things in the name of patriotism and war? Professor Dan Baron is a psychologist from Israel who works with the children of Nazi perpetrators and the children of Jews who survived the death camps of Germany. We spoke to him about what we can learn from that experience. We know what the unbelievable mechanisms of repression, of forgetting, of distortion, perpetrators use, of justification, in order not to remember what they have done. When the victims come and tell their stories, it reminds, it can remind the perpetrators of what they have done. And it's a very difficult confrontation, which really, I admire your process that you're doing it. I think it has never been done before in such a way. If we know about process of amnesties from the South American countries, it was not done on an individual basis. It was not done with names and stories. And I think this makes the process here such an amazing process, which will be for your coming generation is something to learn from, because through these stories they will really know what has happened. At the same time, I'm sure it must be also an imperfect process, because when you, and I looked at some of the, uh, the, the sessions, and you look at some of the perpetrators, and as they are so occupied with the question of how to get amnesty, they don't deal, deal, really deal with their own feelings, and they also don't deal with the feelings of the victims, and some of the victims get very upset with it. So these processes can't go so fast. They need much more time. You know, there are psychological tools which can uh, divide people into different pathologies and uh, we, can, we know that some people are, have this pathology and other pathology. And clearly some, a small proportion of the perpetrators have these pathologies. I mean, some of them are really sadist, but it's relatively a very small proportion. I would assume, on based of, on, of what I know from, from our work, with Nazi perpetrators, there, there may be 5% of them. All the others, there is no psychological test which could identify ahead of time that these people would become perpetrators. What that actually means, that maybe under certain circumstances, with a certain way of training, with a certain socialization, with a certain infrastructure of ideology, of power structure, almost every, every one of us could become to some extent, a perpetrator. As psychologists especially, we became aware with the years that, uh, that this need to create a, a character which is uh, the typical perpetrator is too simple, so too simple an, an assumption. And we have to think about it that many of the perpetrators, let's say the Nazi perpetrators, I interviewed their children, they were very nice uh, parents to their children. Some of them were very polite people. Some of them, after the war, trained their children not to lie and not to steal and so on. So these, this mixture in, in, in people, this, these contradictions in people, people probably are not made out of one thing, but have different parts which sometimes don't fit together. And under such circumstances, some part of a person can be led to do such horrible things where other parts may be still functioning within the normal social setting.